Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Oh, man, it is good. I was just checking, you know. Okay, thank you for confirming that for me. My name is Buzz, and uh, I have the extreme privilege of being the lead pastor here at Element Church, and this is my first day preaching to you on this stage. All right. That's good. That's good. I'm, you have confidence in me. We'll do another one at the end, and you'll see, okay, did he, did he meet the expectations or whatever? Um, which is fun. We have loved Element Church. We have loved Cheyenne. And I just want to begin today by saying thank you for enfolding my family and I so well with just love and grace and kindness and hospitality. It has been amazing. You know, every time my family checks on me or people back in California check on us, we say we see God's grace all around every step of the way. And you guys have been a big part of that. So thank you so much. Now, thinking about preaching is like preaching's kind of weird because I'm going to stand here and I'm going to tell you stuff about what the Bible says. And my worry today is that I'm going to get in the middle of you seeing the Bible clearly. You know, I'm worried that you're going to think about like, oh, are his jokes funny or is his message good or do I like this guy or not? And so my prayer for you this week has been that that will not actually be what we worry so much about, but rather, man, what is the scripture trying to tell us? Because I believe that the scripture is true, that it has the power to change lives. And as we look into the scripture today... I believe that your life can be changed as a result. And just like Jared helped us sing together today that hope has a name, his name is Jesus. And so if you need hope, I think you're in the right spot today because we're about to start our new series called Fire Forged Faith. Did you like those like Bernie images that we had? Were you thinking about like a forge like a blacksmith or were you thinking like I was about like some wood smoked barbecue? All right, here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Fire is like a tool that we can use to make things better, whether it's your beef or your steel like a blacksmith, right? But to, to forge something into a tool that's going to last the test of time, that's going to find the purpose for which it is made, we have to heat it hot, we have to temper it. There's a stressful pressure that's brought to bear. And that's why I'm calling the series Fire Forged Faith. Because I believe the Lord wants to use the pressure in your life to build something beautiful and something which lasts. This Fire Forged Faith series, we're going to be looking at the life of a guy called Nehemiah. Nehemiah has a whole book named after him in the Old Testament, basically his journal of God's faithfulness in his own life. We're going to see today how God sparked into flame his calling in his own life. But before we do that, I would love to tell you about a time I sparked a fire into flame in my own life. You guys want to hear about this? Yeah. You're like, yeah, for sure we do. What did he screw up this time? Well, <laughs> there I was, 16 years old, growing up on the uh, semi-rural Kansas plains. And my friend John was about to have his birthday. And so he asked his dad, like any 16-year-old would for their birthday present, hey, dad, don't tear down the old shed. Let me bring my friends over and then we can burn it down together. And then we can, you know, roast hot dogs and marshmallows and stuff like that. You guys know what I'm talking about. I told this story in California one time, and they were like, we better call the police. And you guys are like, yeah, that's what we do. We burn stuff down here. So I feel at home very much so, you know. So we get out there into the shed. You know, it's like an old shed. It lived a good life. It had a purpose. It was useful. But it had kind of, it was in need of some fresh vision for that land. You know, time to clear it away. Old, dusty, dry shed. But we solved that dryness. Man, we soaked that thing ceiling to floor in gasoline. Perfect. <laughs> It was ready for a flame. All it needed was what? A spark. There you go. But not just any boring old spark. This is a 16-year-old's birthday, and so we needed a spectacular spark. So we came up with some ideas, and the first idea, we're so smart, so genius. Write this down. Okay, we had a metal gas can. You know the metal gas cans that they sell slash used to sell? We thought if we put that in the front door of the shed and shoot it with a shotgun, it was going to... Yes. George, you've done that many times, I can see. I can see. Well, you know, nobody's watching. We'll keep it up. Just between us. Uh, so we set the gas can up, filled it with gas, of course, and shot it with a shotgun. And what do you think happened? Nothing, man. It was disappointing. Disappointing. It was a lot of noise, a lot of energy, and ultimately not a lot of spark, not a lot of flame. But we were undeterred, you guys. We found somewhere we sourced, I don't know if we knew Robin Hood or something, but we had a bow and arrow. And my friend Jeremy, not to name any names, Jeremy thought, oh, let's take a rag, let's soak the rag in gasoline, let's light the rag on fire, tie it to the arrow, not in that order, and then shoot the arrow <laughs> into the shed. That's going to be spectacular. But have you ever tried to shoot an arrow that has a, like a gas-soaked flaming rag on it? It just kind of messes with the balance a little bit, you know? 
that's what a lot of the armorers are telling us. And so like, we couldn't even get it out the bow like into the shed. And it was like, okay, by now we really need to get this thing going. Let's just take a normal old match and toss it in there. Let's wave the white flag. But no, we had one more idea. We opened the repository of fireworks. We pulled out all the Roman candles. Yes, yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. And we encircled that thing and we, we were not disappointed. That worked really good. That was really good. Really, 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 really good. Too good, perhaps, because like I said, we'd soaked that thing in gasoline. It took off like a house on fire. That's, in fact, when the phrase was invented, me burning down that shed. And it was so hot, it melted the nails. It burned everything all the way down, like super hot. And I learned a couple of things that day. And I don't remember what I learned. I have to look at my notes to remember what I learned because I was like, man, we should burn down a shed today. That was super, <laughs> super fun, you know? Uh, but that hot heat was not just for fun, it had a purpose, didn't it? Which was to clear out that shed, to make that space fresh and new for whatever the Dunbar family needed to do on their property. This thing was kind of tired and it is in need of a fresh spark in its life, which we helpfully provided with those Roman candles. But I wonder if there's some of us here in the church today who are thinking kind of like, man, there's some parts of my life that are old, that are kind of dry, that are kind of in need of a fresh spark for the Lord to clear some things away that we might use our lives in a fresh visionary way as he has us to do. We can spark into flame. We can clear some space for God to move. And I would love to look with you now in Nehemiah chapter one and see how the Lord was able to do that in the life of Nehemiah. Would you like to do that with me? Well, you're trapped in here, so it doesn't really matter what uh, you want or not. But let's look at Nehemiah chapter one. We're gonna read pretty much all the way through chapter one today, but we'll pause at some different points. But I'd love to start just like uh, the sound of music taught us at the very beginning, verse one. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. And they said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. All right, let's pause there. A couple of things. First one for free. Let me give you the clue on how to pronounce any Old Testament unfamiliar name. Are you ready for this? Say it with confidence, nobody else knows either, okay? <laughs> so that's how you say those names. All right, but, but number two, and more importantly, of course, is, what is where's Nehemiah at? What is he talking about? Sometimes you read the Bible and it's like, just like somebody dropped all the pages on the floor, you don't know the order or how quite they connect. So Nehemiah is really interesting because he is one of the very last Old Testament figures before the coming of Jesus Christ. And so Nehemiah is a real interesting point in history because he hasn't yet seen Christ come. He's been promised... He knows that God is going to bring a Messiah one day, but then he also looks back at all of the Israelite history. So he looks back at somebody like Abraham, back at somebody like Moses, back at somebody like King David, who are these kind of real superstars of the faith you might think about. And Nehemiah is standing there in captivity in a foreign land. We know this because it says he's in King Artaxerxes' court. That's a Persian king. He's a stranger, a captive in a land not his own. And he stands as a stranger in that strange land as a captive and thinks to himself, will God be as good to me as he was to Abraham? Will God be as good to me as he was to Moses? Will God be as good to me as he was in David? Look at this. I don't have anything. My homeland is not doing well. Where is God in the midst of all of this? Hmm. Maybe you think that too yourself today. Where is God in the midst of my life? I've seen God's faithfulness in the lives of others, but I'm feeling like a dried, old, up, dusty shed. I need a fresh spark and I need a fresh flame. And I see that here in Nehemiah chapter one. Nehemiah gets that spark in conversation. All right, you might say Nehemiah was sparked here by conversation between his brother, Hakaliah, and himself. Now, the term brother, it might mean actual sibling, it might mean friend, it might mean countryman, but that's not as important as the news that Hakaliah shared, right? Nehemiah is sparked by this conversation. He tells him the truth about what's happening. And what is Hakaliah's report? Everything's fine, man. Everything's good. 
No, he tells the truth. He says, it is not good for those of us in Jerusalem. It is not good. You know, I think I have conversations with my friends, my brothers, each and every day, whether it's conversations at work, conversations in the home, conversations in my fantasy football chat, conversations with my uh, prayer accountability partners, just conversations. And very few of them, it seems, actually spark lifelong change in the lives of others. I wonder sometimes if that's because we choose to shrink back at the final moment. I wonder if Hakaliah had lived like us and said, like, everything's good, everything's fine, everything's surface, everything's trivial, knowing there's like a deeper truth he wants to share, but just instead of leaning in to something hard, what if he had leaned out like we sometimes do? I don't want to rock the boat, I don't want to cause a scene, I want to just, I'll solve it myself. Hakaliah had the courage to speak truth. He had the courage to speak truth. And it sparked something into flame in Nehemiah's life. I mean, the book of James, in fact, compares our ability to do this to one another to like a spark, like a flame. In fact, let's turn to James chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, and see how James, the brother of Jesus, tells us. He says it this way, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder can make a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Wow, James (laughs) has some harsh words for our harsh words, doesn't he? He compares it to a spark of devastating fire that can be set on fire by hell itself and burn everything down if we choose to use it to destroy one another. But there's another half to it here, isn't there? James shows us the corrective, the prescriptive, the healing power of the tongue. He says it can be like something which turns a horse or something which turns a ship. And so you get to choose. Do you want to use your power in the lives of conversation to burn each other down like a raging forest fire, or do you want to use it to shape for the good? You know, I think if we're honest, our conversations often are a lot more like me shooting that gas can, like a lot of noise, very little purpose. Man, I wonder if today the Lord is asking us to have a little bit more purpose as we spark one another in conversation. You know, one of the things that I find interesting about Nehemiah receiving that spark is that it's Hanani's telling him nothing he doesn't already know. It's not as if Nehemiah, who's been captive his whole life, has learned for the first time that things are not good in the life of the children of Israel. He knows. He wakes up every day, goes to work, he knows. He goes to bed every night, he knows. But yet, there was something about this conversation that landed in such a way that now it changed everything. I wonder if there are some of us here, too, who are trying to receive something that we know full well to be true, if we might have the courage today to finally let it light us into flame, that that spark can find a home, and finally we can have some passion to do something about it. You know, we might be like Hakaliah, needing to have a forceful conversation, a gentle, a kind one like Jesus taught us, or we might be like Nehemiah, where we know full well what we ought to do, and yet we just can't find that spark. And this is why I love in Nehemiah 1, verses 4 and following, we see how Nehemiah was able to kind of breathe that spark into flame. And we see here that Nehemiah was powered by prayer. Let's look in verse 4 and see what it tells us. He says it this way, When I heard this, this news that Jerusalem wasn't doing good, he says, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, I fasted, and I prayed to the God of heaven. All right, so this is that second key in Nehemiah's call, how God sparked him into flame. He was powered by prayer. He was sparked by conversation, but then here he is powered by prayer. So when he gets that wider vision and has that compassion for this problem that the Lord needs him to solve, he doesn't run out with an action plan. In fact, his first move is to sit down, to weep, and to feel deeply to mourn to fast and to pray and not just to wallow in those feelings but to invite God into it and to turn those emotions back to the Lord 
And this is one thing I actually love about being a follower of Jesus. No matter the scale of the problem we're facing, no matter how deeply it makes us grieve or hurt or feel, Jesus is in the midst of it with you. He says that he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And so when you're out there looking, like Nehemiah is, at a shed life that just needs to be burned down, Jesus is in the midst of it with you. And if we'll just invite him in, man, we'll find such power in that. Now, I'm also not naive to think that if you just simply pray a quick prayer that your emotions will turn around and your circumstances will turn around. Like that's not the life Jesus promises. If you just do it right, there's a quick and easy fix. In fact, the Apostle Paul says this is like a fellowship with Christ's sufferings. There's an expectation that this might go on and on for a while, yet he is in it with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So if you're wondering, man, is the reason I don't see God in my life because my circumstances haven't turned around? That's not true. You're not doing anything wrong. You're not praying wrong. God is with you. He will carry you. In fact, we see Nehemiah is 12 chapters long. He's got a lot of life to live as he walks this out after the Lord. And in fact, we'll see three weeks from now, everything kind of turns upside down for him anyway. Your success or failure by your own measurement isn't the qualification. God wants to be in the midst of it with you. Nehemiah is powered by prayer, and I hope that we will be likewise. So let's look here in verse 5 and see how Nehemiah chose to pray and see maybe how we can pattern our own prayer life after that. So then Nehemiah said, O Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands and decrees and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. So please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen, for my name is to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and by your strong hand are your servants. O Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. All right, we'll pause there. So if we need that spark in our life to take root and flame as we build a fire-forged faith after our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, how can we pray in the pattern that Nehemiah gave us? And the first thing that I see here is that Nehemiah patterned for us that prayer is praise. Nehemiah patterned prayer as praise or worship. You see that in verse 5 where he's telling God his own attributes and how good God is? You know, sometimes we think that maybe you should start praying to God like you do start talking to your boss about if you need a couple of days off. Oh, boss, you're amazing. I love you. You're the best. Now let me hit you with that vacation request. You guys ever do it this way? Or maybe you ask your parents the same thing. Hey, you don't hit with, hey, can I go to this birthday party? You're like, mom, you're amazing. Thanks for cleaning the, this is the best meal. Awesome. Hey, can I have five bucks, 20 bucks or whatever? You know, like if you get them in the right mood, then their heart will be more attuned to give you what you want. Is that what we do to God when we pray? No, that's not the reason we start with prayer as praise. If you think about prayer, it's not us trying to light a spark in God's heart to do what we want. In fact, I think prayer almost is the opposite of that, that God wants to spark something in us and that when we tell God who he is, his character, his attributes, things like, God, you are holy, he's able to spark in us a desire to be holy. We say, God, you are loving, you are forgiving. He's able to spark in us a desire to be loving and forgiving. God, you are patient and long-suffering. He is able to pull us up into a long-suffering or patient life. We don't butter God up by praying worshipful prayers. In fact, we put ourselves in his presence that we might be changed as a result. We're the ones getting sparked in prayer, not God. (laughs) As if God needs us to tell him what to do. He knows, right? We're the ones who don't know what to do. And in prayer as praise, we can be formed into his character and into his likeness. It's amazing. I encourage you to start your prayer life soaking in praise. You can be a blaze that burns brightly for the Lord. All right, the second thing we see Nehemiah Nehemiah pattern for us in prayer is that prayer is confession. Nehemiah patterns for us prayer as confession. I already told you we soaked that old shed 
ceiling to floor in gasoline. Gas prices were lower back then. We could afford it. But what if we had chosen something different? What if we had soaked it ceiling to floor with water and then tried to spark it? You ever tried to burn wet wood? You probably didn't because it's dumb. You shouldn't burn <laughs> wet wood. It doesn't, it doesn't take. It doesn't light. It just smokes. It sputters. No good at all, right? This is why when you go camping, you make your kids get the dry wood up off the ground, right? I've seen you guys. You know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. Or what if even worse, we had soaked that shed with whatever firefighters are using these days to keep flames from spreading, then we tried to launch some sparks in there and we were wondering to ourselves, how come this shed won't take? And it's like, man, you covered it in flame retardant. Like, it's not going to go. It's so silly. Yet, I think at the same time, we have things in our life that can prevent the Holy Spirit burning how he wishes in our life and we wonder to ourselves, how come my life hasn't took flame? This is where confession comes in. Confession is bringing your wrongdoing into the Lord's presence and allowing him to forgive you or to remove it from you. Right? These things which block God from moving in our life, the scripture calls these things sin. And there are sometimes things in our life that we need to get rid of so that our fuel can be clean and he can burn brightly as a result. Now, have you ever tried to take that wet wood that you found on the ground and then treat it like you do your dish rags where you just like wring it out and get the water all done? You ever tried this? No, because that is also stupid, right? You cannot wring out wood. You can't dry it out. We can basically do nothing to make the wood dry faster, can we? And that's the same thing about getting sin out of our life and into the Lord's hands. You can't wring your own life out like a dish rag. You can do very little to get the sin out of your life other than putting yourself into the presence of the one who can remove it for you. This is what the scripture calls confession. You tell the truth about what's in your heart to a forgiving, loving, gracious God who died for you, you come away pure and clean as a result. And this is what Nehemiah models for us with the prayer of confession. He's not immune to the idea that Israel has sinned and suffered and done stuff wrong, yet God loves them anyway and wants to build them a beautiful future. Same is true for us. Whatever you've done wrong, you can bring it to the Lord, be purified from it, and he will burn brightly in your life as a result. Confession's tough, man. Telling the truth to God is tough, but I promise you, you'll be happy that you did, just like Nehemiah was, modeling for us prayer as confession. Nehemiah then prays in a third way, right? Uh, he patterns for us prayer according to the scriptures. Patterns for us prayer according to the scriptures. And this is just like prayer as praise, where he is looking into the Bible, to the scriptures, to the record of God's faithfulness with his people and reading it back to God. Not to almost like, a, you know, the person in the courtroom who reads back to the, what the witness said. Oh, now you're trapped and you got to do what you said down here. No, it's a way of building intimacy between us and the Father. You don't have to raise your hand, but did any of you guys grow up in a church tradition where pretty much every prayer we prayed was read off of some dry old dusty page? You know, like you open up the old hymn book and like the dust flies up there and you're like, this prayer is not really sparking anything other than uh, a desire for sleep in me, you know? I grew up kind of that way. And when I tell you to, to pray the scriptures, I'm worried that you might think, oh, this just means old, dry, dusty prayer books. But man, I tell you, the scriptures are anything but dead and old and dry and dusty. And if you can get their living activity into our spirit, man, it will really help you. It will light you aflame. Maybe you've never done that. You know? So later this fall, we're going to look at the prayer life of Jesus and have a whole sermon series designed to help us pray like Jesus did. It will bless you. But if you don't know how to pray the scriptures today, I encourage you to start with Nehemiah chapter one that we did today. Wouldn't it help you to pray this prayer like he did to the Lord once a day in the next week? To put yourself into Nehemiah's shoes and let God be faithful to you as a result? Man, that would be awesome. Do you ever go to God and you feel like you don't have the words to say? I do that every day. But the scriptures give me the words that I need to put the handle on my emotions. So pray the scriptures like Nehemiah did. I think it will really, really bless you. All right, and that's the last thing we see in Nehemiah's pattern is uh, prayer as supplication. Prayer as supplication. So if we see prayer as praise, if we see prayer as confession, if we see prayer according to the scriptures, now we see prayer as supplication. Supplication is like my favorite word that was invented in 1100 AD. I love it. It just means asking God for stuff. That's what it means. Supplication, asking Right, we see that at the end of Nehemiah's prayer where he's asking God, will you let the king be favorable to me when I ask him for this big thing in my heart? I love that God, the God of the universe, loves it when we ask him for stuff. He's not afraid of you doing that. He's not mad at you when you do that. 
In fact, Jesus teaches us in the Gospel of Matthew that he is a good father who loves to give good gifts to his children. So if you have something you want in your heart, bring it to him. Be bold about it. Ask him for it. If the Lord is sparking something in your life or burning something away, tell him the truth about it, just like Nehemiah did. I think you'll find yourself liberated as a result. That prayer life will be able to spark something in you that's beautiful and long-lasting. You know, prayer, though, can be kind of lonely, can't it? Sometimes we think, man, I want to do like what Pastor Buzz says. I want to soak myself in prayer. I'll be like this gasoline shed, and when the spark lights, I'm ready to go. And then you find yourself on Monday morning, and you get ready for your prayer time you've got set aside, and it's just so tough to do alone, isn't it? It's tough to be alone. That's why here at Element Church, every week we have our prayer tent in the back. And if you need to pray with somebody, I encourage you, the service, to go and to do that. Be prayed for and be prayed with and be prayed alongside. We also have monthly gatherings, typically on the first week of every month on a Tuesday night. And so come out here and join with the people of God in prayer. Don't suffer alone at home. Trying, come and learn from those of us who have walked with the Lord a little bit, who can help you be prayed for as a result. It's not just up to you to work harder, right? The Lord will make a way for you. Put yourself in position to be prayed for and prayed with, and I think you'll see your life powered as a result. Man, the last thing I saw in Nehemiah's life here in chapter one is he gets sparked into what the Lord had for him in this season. It might be my favorite. You shouldn't have favorite parts of your sermon, just like you shouldn't have favorite children. I don't have favorite children, but I do have the favorite part of my sermon, and it's this one because it's good news for all of us. Here in Nehemiah chapter 1, we see that Nehemiah's preparation was already in progress. Already in progress. Here, look at verse 11 again, because we see this almost throwaway, like almost an aside from the narrator about Nehemiah's life. It says, in those days, I was the cupbearer to the king. What does that have to do with anything? He's telling us his job, what he does for a living. Or is there something more at play there? You know, sometimes we think that the call of God is going to come into our life. We're going to receive this spark. And then the next day we will begin a journey of preparing to fulfill that call. But God is more faithful to us than that. He doesn't drop something on you today that you're not yet ready for. He has been preparing you, I believe, from before the foundations of the world. So Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king, and he had no idea that in chapter 2 and next week, we're going to talk about him embarking upon a rebuilding project in the city. In a sense, he serves as kind of a type of a king for the children of Israel in this next season. And there he is, the king's cupbearer, right, which is basically, in a sense, food service. Anybody work in food service? Did you know the Lord is preparing you for something as you work every single day? Because Nehemiah could have said, all right, it's my job just to fill the king's wine, make sure he has enough drinks, make sure he has enough food. Or he could have thought to himself, I'm standing in the same room as King Xerxes of Persia, the most powerful person in the ancient world. And I'm going to learn a thing or two here in this room. I'm going to see how he talks to his advisors. I'm going to learn. I'm going to see how he solves conflict. I'm going to learn. I'm going to see how he deals with the stress of being a king. I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn what to do. And I'm going to learn what not to to do. I'm not just going to sit here with some drinks and surf my phone. I'm going to pay attention to what the king is doing. And then when it's my turn someday to be in charge, I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be ready. His preparation was already in progress. I don't know. I didn't text Nehemiah to find out, but I bet when he went to cupbearer school, he didn't think to himself one day he's going to be in charge of rebuilding Jerusalem. Yet he was able to be prepared by those experiences that God put in his life each and every day just showing up to work. Man, when I began uh, feeling a call to ministry, I didn't get a ministry job. I don't know if you have heard about life, but there's this stuff called bills and they expect you to pay them. It's so weird. So I got a job to get money to pay my bills. And one of the jobs I got was in the jewelry store. This is kind of like my family business on my dad's side. And I went to, you know, work by day, school by night. Very Batman kind of a situation, you know, and I thought, man, I would really love it if I could just work professionally at a church, that would be awesome and kind of align my calling and kind of align my preparation. But you know what happened to me at the jewelry store is I became very prepared for ministry by working at Hellsberg Diamonds at the mall, you know. I learned a lot of stuff about ministry. For example, I learned a lot about marriage counseling, helping couples choose engagement rings. Man, I learned a lot. (laughs) And here's my first marriage tip for you. Choose well, man. It will be great. Not your ring, your spouse. 
Oh, man, I learned about uh, marriage counseling in the jewelry store. I learned about honoring your spouse over a long period of time when I help people pick out anniversary gifts. You're here for your 50th anniversary. How did you do it? How are you faithful? Great job. I learned about uh, (laughs) righting wrongs when people came in and they're like, my wife is mad. I need to buy this thing. (laughs) I learned a lot, a lot, a lot about life in the jewelry store. I also learned I didn't need to wait for a job to begin to act like a pastor or act like a minister. I didn't need to wait to get a paycheck to start praying for people. I could pray for my coworkers right then and there. I didn't need to wait to be a pastor to be light and salt in our community as an evangelist. There's hundreds of people coming through my door every single day. I didn't need to wait to be a pastor to begin to learn to study. I could do that in every instant that God had given me there in the jewelry store. And I admit I did not show up for my preparation as much as I should have done every day at Hellsburg Diamonds. I did not like that job and I was happy to quit the instant that I could. Yet, if I ever do a wedding for you or officiate at a funeral for you, I bet you that it is more formed by my time in that mall on South Lewis than it was in my time in Bible school. I didn't expect that, but the Lord has been preparing me even in the jewelry store. So Nehemiah is in food service and I'm in mall retail and where are you? Where are you? How is the Lord preparing you for what he has for you? Man, some of us have no idea. How can we have any idea about the future God has for us? But we can show up. We can pay attention. We can be there. God is preparing you for something. And when that spark falls in your heart, you don't have to start the next day working on it. He has been preparing you for your lifetime and you can just go for it. You don't have to catch the spark and wait. You can catch the spark and just burst into flame with what God has called you to do. That's what we see in Nehemiah. In fact, next week, we're going to look at chapters 2 and 3 and 4 and see how his ministry was birthed, what he did as a result of this call. But his preparation had been in progress for a long, long time. And so let me ask you this morning, how do you see that spark of God in your life? What is the Lord sparking in you even this morning? You know, we looked at a lot of different things. First, we looked at Hakaliah. Uh, a friend, a brother who was bold enough to have a truthful conversation. Maybe that's what God is calling you to do today. Tell the truth to somebody you love about something they need to know and something they need to hear. Maybe you need to be like Nehemiah, where God has been trying to tell you some truth in your heart for a while, and you need to open your eyes to see it and to act as a result. Maybe you need to be powered a little bit by prayer like Nehemiah was, whether in praise or confession or in the scriptures or in supplication. Maybe the reason God hasn't acted in your life is because you just never asked him to. I don't know. Or maybe those of us who are still waiting for that spark or for that turnaround in our life can just show up to our preparation he's doing to us day by day as a result. You never know how God will use you, but I guarantee you he will not waste an instant of your life in preparation. Or maybe we're here at the end of this message time and you think, man, I have no idea what to do with this. And that's probably like 90% of us because sometimes following God's call is tricky. It's complicated and it's tough. And that's why I love that we're in uh, a season where we're launching our community groups ministry, right? Pastor Kat's out there. And if you are saying to yourself, like, I would just love to come alongside some other people each and every week to get some encouragement in the scriptures, to be prayed for, and to have somebody who can tell me truth and for whom I can receive, That's what we mean when we talk about groups. We've got tons out there for you to participate in. Maybe you just need to show up. Or maybe you find yourself, every time we launch groups, wandering by, wondering if this or that particular group that you really need has been launched yet. And I wonder if that's actually God trying to spark you into taking the step to say, man, I will lead this thing. I've wanted this. I've needed this for a long time. It hasn't happened to me. Maybe God wants to spark you into providing that for someone else. I don't know. I don't know where the Lord is sparking you and where he is trying to breathe in you this flame of fire that can forge our faith into something that will last a lifetime. But I think if you hear God pulling on your heart, let me pray for you that he can breathe that spark into something which lasts. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you that your word is true and that somebody like Nehemiah who lived more than 2,000 years ago still struggled with the same things that we do. God, we confess that like Nehemiah, sometimes we look out at our life and think we need some freshness here. God, would you provide it for us just like you did for him? Sometimes, God, we need a friend to tell us some truth. Would you provide for us trustworthy friends who do so? And may our hearts be soft to follow you as a result. God, sometimes we need to, like Nehemiah, spend some time in grief or prayer or struggle with you. And God, would you meet us in those places 
Would you encourage us in those places? And would you move in those places, we pray? And God, some of us are feeling prepared for something and that something isn't here yet. And so God, we pray that that something would be speeded along, that we can see the fruitful result of what you have been building in our life all along. God, for those of us who still haven't yet perceived where you are calling, can we just have the faith to follow you step after step, day by day? Tell us in uh, the Psalms that your word is like a light to our path. And so, Father, may we take one step after you just as you light the way. Make us bold to do it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.